In this video, I'm going to be using Kubernetes to run some pods locally, and I'll be using kind for that. Now, kind is just a way for me to run a simple Kubernetes cluster on my local machine, but there are also some other tools that do something that's similar. Minikube is a tool that comes to mind, but I'll be running kind instead because it's just a little bit more lightweight. The idea is that on my server, I am going to be running a Docker container inside of which Kubernetes is running. That is how kind works. Minikube works in a similar way, but it would run it in a virtual machine. And that is why kind is just a little bit more lightweight. So I'll tell kind to go ahead and create a cluster on my machine. And after a while, we seem to be up and running. Now I can confirm that there is a Docker container running right now via the Docker processes command. And here we can indeed confirm that there is a container ID as well as an image that's currently running. From here, what I'm going to do though, is I'm going to be using the kube control or kubectl command. And it's this command that I will use to interact with the Kubernetes cluster inside of this container. Kubectl will be my gateway into Kubernetes and the experience that I have right now locally is very close to what you would have when you're running this actually in production on a cloud provider. So let's start with something relatively basic. I'm going to start by saying, well, let's create a namespace and let's call it demo. The idea is that in this namespace, I can go ahead and start some pods and then I can easily throw it away later. Given that I now have this namespace, I can refer to it in this command. And here I'm going to say, well, let's create a deployment. And I'll call the deployment web stuff. It's just a name that I'll need for now. And what I can say is, well, I would like to have this Docker image. I'll use the Nginx Docker image as a basic demo. And I want to have three replicas of that. Again, in this command, I'm telling kube control to do something in the namespace called demo. That's the namespace that I created over here. And I am creating a deployment. You can also create other objects, but I'm going for a deployment now. The name of the deployment is going to be web stuff. I'm going to be using the nginx docker container and I'm going to be running three replicas of that container. So that means that I will have three pods running this. So far, so good. So what I can do now is again, I can refer to my namespace and now I can say, hey, Kubernetes, could you just tell me what pods I have running right now? And this gives you this table. Now note that the name of the deployment over here is referred to in the name of the pod over here. It's only part of the name though, because there's also this random bit after it. And that's because we are running three replicas. And these pods are currently running and all that stuff is good. But what I can now do is I can choose to scale these pods. I'm about to run a new command, namely the scale command that I'm still running in the same namespace and I'm still pointing to the same deployment. But what this command allows me to do is turn the three pods that are running into five pods that are currently running. After scaling, I ran the get pods command again, and we can see that there indeed are three replicas that already ran before, but that I now also have two new replicas that are a little bit younger, but all of these pods are currently running and they all adhere to the same name convention. Now, what I can also do is I can do it in the other direction. I can say I only want to have one replica running And when I do this and get the pod information right after, then we can see that there is definitely still one pod running, but all the other ones are currently terminating. All of this is just happening on my local machine. But one thing that is pretty interesting is that with just a single command, we can easily spin up and spin down pods with containers. And it's this adaptability that's very useful about Kubernetes. It's easy to change and scale. 
There are some other things that we can do as well. So for example, I can say, hey, cube control within the same namespace as before, could you please get me the logs from this running pod? And this allows me to see the logs that are being made inside of the container, which can be useful for debugging. But one thing that is important to remember when you're working with Kubernetes is that it's very important to keep this namespace in mind. If I were now to remove the namespace and ask for the same query, it would not be able to find the pod. And the same thing would happen if I just give it the get pods command. The idea here is that there are no resources running in the default namespace, but if I just attach the namespace that I had in the beginning, namely the demo one, then I do see everything that's made in that namespace. The reason why I want to emphasize this is because it's important to understand that namespaces really do split up a Kubernetes cluster. Whenever you're working with kubectl, keep in mind that you're working in a namespace most of the time. One thing I could do though, is I could ask for all the namespaces. And then we see quite a few, but it's this demo one that I created myself. And what I can do is I can create a new namespace. I can create one for Raza, for example. And when I look at my namespaces, I should see that the namespace for Raza just got created here at the bottom. And what I can safely do right now as well is just delete the namespace for my demos. Next up, I would really like to do something with this Raza namespace. I would really like to start some pods and containers there, but this will be a good time to maybe stop and think in terms of how we want to do that. So far, we've mainly been sending commands directly via the terminal. And although that works, this won't necessarily scale. Sure, I might be able to give the number of replicas, but maybe a deployment is more than just a couple of pods. Sure, I might have a couple of pods that have containers running inside of them, and that will be fine, but maybe what I would also like to do is add a service in front of it. In particular, we can have a load balancer that can give us a single IP that can route traffic to my Raza instances. And here you can imagine that there's quite a few settings that we would like to pass along, but we want these settings to be in one single place. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe this configuration in a configuration file. We will use YAML for this. And sometimes these files are referred to as manifests. So I will just write a very simple one that demonstrates the base usage. But one thing that I will do is I will run my own custom Raza container that I built in a previous video of this series. That way I can also show you a little bit of customization options as well. So here's an example of a manifest.yaml file. It's a pretty big file with lots of things in it, but let's zoom in on this one particular part that's important, namely these three dashes. You see, the YAML file format allows you to split up your YAML file into different segments. And that's a feature that you can do a lot with when you're writing these Kubernetes deployments. The bit that you see over here has to do with pods and this container that has to run inside of it. Then there are some dashes again, which is a way of splitting up the file. And here I'm defining something else. Here I'm defining a service. So in short, you could say that everything that's happening above here has to do with pods and containers, and everything below here is about hooking them up to a static IP. With that out of the way, let's scroll back up again and see what we have over here. Here we are configuring a deployment. It's a deployment that we can give a name, and it's also a deployment that we can give a label. The app label refers to the string Raza. What follows next is a specification. I'm saying, hey, I want to have two replicas. And again, there's a reference to the label below here. But the real description of what the pods are supposed to do in this deployment is defined over here. 
I am giving this container a name. It's the Raza demo. There's a reference to the Docker container image, which again is hosted on Docker Hub. I am able to tell it which port to open up on the pod. And I'm also giving it a command to run when the pod is up and running. The main reason I want to show this bit in particular is because this shows you that you can really customize your deployments. You can use the same container with different commands if that's something you're interested in. But for our intents and purposes, at least for now, this is the container that we made earlier, the one that has a NLU model that we can query. Mentally though, this would only give us two pods. And again, it's two because the replica factor is set to two. But once these pods are running on our little Kubernetes cluster, we will have two IP addresses that are dynamic. These pods might be thrown away, which means that we cannot rely on the IP address that's assigned to them on creation. And that's what our service is going to be for, because it's our service that is going to be able to hook up these dynamic IP addresses to a static one. You might wonder though, how do we actually make the connection? How does this service know to what pods to forward the traffic to? All of that is related to this label that we've added. When you scroll down, you can see that we are defining a service. We're able to give it a name. But in particular, there is this selector over here, which is pointing to apps with the name Raza. And here I'm also defining that this is a service that is of type load balancer. So this should take care of what I'm interested in. Having said all of that, we now have our manifest.yaml file. It's this file that contains a bunch of configurations. And that's nice because that means that we can just point Kubernetes to this one file, which means that we have less manual things on the command line that we need to concern ourselves with. In practice, you might end up with somewhat big YAML files. So it's also possible to split these files up. I won't go too much in depth though, because I mainly want to provide an intuition here. So what I'll do now is I'll start up the terminal again, and I'll use this file to interact with Kubernetes. So I'm back in my terminal again. Again, I will hit kubectl, but now I'm going to make use of the Raza namespace. And here I'm gonna say, well, I would like to apply this manifest.yaml file. Everything that's defined in this file will now get applied to this namespace. Let's have a look at the pods. The pods that I'm running now are definitely more heavy than the pods I was running before. After all, the containers in here carry somewhat heavy Raza models, so it might take a while before the container is actually properly created. One thing that I could do now though, while everything's spinning up, is I could say, oh wait, maybe I don't wanna have two replicas of those pods. Maybe I would like to have three. I can now rerun this command. And once again, I can get my pod status. We can still see that some containers are being created, but we do see that we were able to add another pod. I'll set the replica factor back to two because I think that's a good number. And now we can see that two pods have indeed booted up and the third one that I just created is terminating. Let's run this command one more time. And we now see that the pod that we were terminating before is now gone. And right now we have two pods running the container that I defined in my file over here. So one thing that this allows me to do now is inspect the logs. I can have a look at the logs from this pod. Just got to copy the name here. And again, got to make sure that I'm indeed in the right namespace. But when I inspect this, it indeed seems like this is the debug information that you would get when you start a new Raza server. So all of that makes sense. A final thing that I can also do is I can confirm that my services are running. Instead of getting the pods, I'll be getting the services. And here indeed, I can confirm that we have a Raza web service 
that's a load balancer that is currently running on a IP address. And this IP address is static. And this is referring to what we defined over here. And the reason is that I'm currently running this on my local machine and I don't want to have an external IP open. What I can do though is I can port forward this IP address to my local machine. To do that, you will need to run this port forward command. Again, making sure that we are in the right namespace. And here I'm saying, hey, take the Raza web service, making sure that these two are the same. And here I'm saying, look, take my port 8080 and map that to the service port. What I can now do is I can actually send a post request. I've created one with curl over here. And basically this will send data to my local 8080 port slash model slash pars. This is going to be forwarded to the load balancer that I have over here, which in turn is going to forward it to one of my pods. We can indeed confirm that a connection got handled. We even got some JSON back as a response. And what I can now do is I can check the logs in both of these pods. Let's check the first one. And as we can confirm from this debug message, this pod handled the request. We got our confidence value, we got our intent. So this went well. And if I now check the other pod, we can see that it didn't handle any request. The request will only be sent to one pod, so this makes sense. So there you go. In this video, we've shown how you are able to define these deployment files and how you're able to run that on Kubernetes using this cube control command line interface. There really is a lot of complexity that's been hidden away from you by doing this, but I do hope that a voice in your head is kind of wondering if we really want to work this way. We really have only shown you a single Raza service here that doesn't even include custom actions or Raza X. And although it's great that we may have gained an intuition in Kubernetes, you might be wondering if there's just a simpler way to go about all of these separate components. And you might also be reminded by Python. After all, let's think about it. When you install a new package with Python, you simply call pip install Raza. And in this case, pip will take care of finding all the required dependencies of Raza and make sure that it's installed in such a state that you can run it. It would be a lot better if we had something similar for Kubernetes, where we would be able to say, hey, look, I would really like to install some sort of recipe that's going to have everything that I need to run Raza X on top of Kubernetes. And that all the dependencies will also be taken care of which will include not just pods, but also all of these services. In Python, you would use pip for this. But in Kubernetes, there's a service called Helm that makes it a whole lot easier to install larger applications on top of Kubernetes. And what I would like to do in the next video is explain the need for Helm in a bit more detail.